to a motel on Christmas Eve. I intended to end my life. I lived most of my life out of control. I had abused drugs and alcohol. I was put out of my home. My wife told me to leave. And as I'm sitting in that room, I noticed the book lying on top of the TV. And I looked down and I saw that it was a Gideon Bible. And I thought, Psh, who needs that? And I took my hand and I swiped it off on the floor. Well, it fell at my feet, but it fell open. What I read changed my life. I said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Today, I'm a pastor. <laughs> my family has been restored. My wife has forgiven me. We work together in ministry. All of this because of one Bible, in one room, and one night. Thank God for the Gideons, and thank God for the Bibles that they put in the, in the motel rooms.
And this is the testament that we give out. We have plan of salvation in the back. Now, we do not ask people, would you like a copy of God's Word? We say, here is a free gift. Our ministry is not to give out Bible. It's to read the people for Jesus. And so it's so important to get this book in the hands of people. And that's what we did in all states with Thanksgiving. It's a joy to be able to do that. Now, part of the, one of the ways that we give out Bibles is through our Memorial Bible Program. You've got a Bible rack over here. And in that Bible rack, it has some cards. And the cards say, thinking of you, or praying for you, a birthday, or in memory. It's a marvelous way to give books. You've seen the Bible in the hotel room. And when you see a Bible in the hotel room and it's blue, it's called a Memorial Bible. And by filling out what the information is in this bulletin, you can send Bibles in honor of an event or a departed loved one anywhere in the world. Now you can send a card or we'll send it with your advice as to what your information is. I had a very special experience this weekend. I talked to someone I, I had not met before. And uh, when you meet Scott Allison, you want to know him, and you want him to know you because he's bigger than a household. <laughs> and he's got a sweet spirit. He's a beautiful guy. And uh, but he was talking about his father who died just two weeks ago. He talked about the love he had for his father. He was an only child. His father was taken from him just two weeks ago. Just thinking what a loss that was for him. But he said what also hurt him is he wasn't at his father's side when he passed away. And this big healthy man had tears running down his cheeks. And I thought what a beautiful testimony it is, a father who loved Jesus. And then that love transported that love for Jesus to his son. And they're poured with that good. But then Scott said something to me that bless my heart. He said, in my father's passing, 125 Bibles were given in his memory. Now, the Bibles cost $5 a piece. And we know in our experience that a Bible placed in a hotel room will last five or six years. And in that five or six years, some 2,300 people will come in contact with it. But Scott didn't know that the Bibles that were given in memory of his father has the potential of reading 270,000 people. And how neat is that? Praise the Lord, I know that they have loved Jesus, but I doubt if he could have made that many contact. Mm -hmm. But that's the program that we're so, so happy for. I was at a banquet just recently. The speaker was talking about our ministry in Malawi, Africa. Now, Malawi is very special to me. I've spent time in Malawi, but I haven't been there in a number of years. He was talking about a poor country that's incredibly poor. He was talking about a country where there is no trash. They are so poor they have no trash. Everything is used. I'm talking about a country that over 70,000 children starved to death last year. A country without hope. <laughs> There's a man called Ben Yondo, who's a good friend of mine. He lives in Malawi, the language. The language. And I worked with Ben. And I got an email from Ben several months ago. And I'm going to read you a portion of this email. But I'm going to tell you first that Ben told me that 24 men from his camp went to a district in the farthest parts of Malawi. And they were given 20 schools to visit and maps for those 20 people. And they spent two days nothing but giving out the word of God to those students. And I'm going to pick it up after that explanation. It said, on Saturday morning, the teachers came to me and asked if I could wait for, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When they went back after Friday to thank the district for their aid in getting to the schools, the district told them there was one area that they didn't give a match to because cars can't get there. And so they told other well, people they had to come Saturday to the district office because cars couldn't get to them. Let me pick up the email. On Saturday morning, the teachers came to me and asked if I would wait for half an hour so the children could rest. The teacher said that they left their village at 3 a.m. to get to the district office by 
The teachers and children sang songs to keep the wild animals off as they walked the dark path to the district office. The teachers told me that by the time they arrived home, they will have walked 41 miles. I gave out 874 New Testaments to the students and three Bibles to the teachers of the school. The teacher said that 100% of the students were willing to walk that distance to receive their scripture. The district office had sent word to this school that all the other schools in the district were to receive their Bibles, and if that school wanted to receive theirs, they should come to the district office on Saturday morning. Every child had a piece of plastic to protect their testament for the journey home. As I watched these children leave, I nearly shed tears, but I controlled myself. <clears throat> we hear the term, hunger for the word of God. It's a very real term. But that applies to people who love Jesus and don't have the word of God. I suggest to you, when you hear that word, what people are really saying is people have hunger for hope. We have the word of hope. These kids have no hope. That's why they would walk the distance they did to get the message of hope. But that's the opportunity we have. Why would I be here today? Pray that doors stay open. Pray that men are willing to do still what they can do in circumstances to get the word of God into the hands of kids. It's easy to go to Ball State. It's a joy. It's a joy to be in Malawi, Africa, but it's a difficult circumstance. Pray for those situations remain. I would love for more people in this congregation to get in. It's such a great work. It's not, it's such a simple work. And I'd love to talk to you about the possibilities right here in Gallup. They're beautiful. And I'm happy to be a part of that right here in Gallup. And I like to be able to say, we don't want your money. You just get an amen for that, right? <laughs> but let me tell you something. You may, you may not know. 100% of what is given goes to buy the word of God. That we pay what's necessary to get it into the hands of kids. You see, as kids, we pay a yearly due. And that pays all the administrative costs of the ministry world apart. But that's the opportunity we have to get the word of hope in the hands of people. This weekend, and I was with fellow believers, sharing the hope and love we have in Jesus Christ. And the message was also to share that hope with your God and to share that hope beyond that. Folks, that's called Daniels.
finally get opening it up and finding it on the inside. This is in memory of someone else. One of the greatest things you can ever do, we shared this on a couple's retreat this week. One of the greatest things you can ever give to your kids, one of the greatest testimonies you can ever have is to leave the legacy of Godliness with them so that they know the Lord. You, you'll never go to Malawi, more than likely. I'll never go to Malawi, more than likely. But to be a part of a sending effort, a gospel sharing effort by putting a few dollars in a bucket or by filling out a car like this and saying, I want to help place Bibles. Kids in colleges are getting a Bible because of you, your gifts. People in, in your schools, kids are, because of gifts that are given, have an opportunity to have the testament of Christ in their hands. So I just want to pray for Tom and pray for, for the Gideon International, pray for our church and how we can be involved more in, uh, in sharing the gospel around the world. Would you bow to please? Lord, we're about to, to open this great word today. We're going to examine its contents. And Lord, we just pray that your spirit would be a lamp to our feet and light to our path. Lord, I do lift up on Tom to his, his loved wife, Patty, and, and for all the kids and for the work that they do. I thank you for them. Lord, I pray that you give them a, a, just a fresh boldness and the courage to continue to share. Uh, Lord, for some that are weary, for some that are broken, Lord, their lives may be falling apart. They still have a heartbeat to share the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would be their strength, that you would be their comfort and their joy. Lord, I pray that you would open more doors for the gospel to be shared. And more doors are closing every day. That they don't allow you to hand out Bibles anymore. Maybe they'll let us hand out a free gift to someone. Thank you for Tom and the work that they do. Bless him. Bless his family. Bless the Gideons. Lord, bless Faith Church. Continue to seek you, that we can take this gospel around the world. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible is one of the greatest gifts God has given us. It is the word of the living God, and it is something we must read and take to heart. Well, most of it anyway. There are some parts that are less relevant to Christians than others. That is why we should think of the word of God like a giant buffet that we can enjoy by picking and choosing the parts we like and leaving the other parts behind. That's the best part of the Word of God. It is so big that you can shave a lot off it and never even notice. You have 66 books to choose from, so even if you don't think half of them relate to you, you can read the other 33 to learn about our loving God. So take time to read the parts of the Bible you like the most and forget about the rest as you enjoy the Word of God. These have been Deep Thoughts from a Shallow Christian. There you go. You thought I was off my rocker there for a little bit. May it never be. And I'm glad that you laughed at that, uh, rather than thinking that that is something that we hold dear. This is a, uh, not a book of magic potions, not a book of how-tos so you can fix everything that uh, is a problem in your life. It's a revelation. A revelation I really didn't start getting to know really and truly until about five or six years ago. I knew quite a bit of the Bible. I knew a lot that was in there, a lot of the stories, a lot of the, the content. But I really didn't know the God of the Bible like I thought I did. Until I started examining the pages. Until I started taking some of it to heart. Until I started wrestling with some of the concepts that it had. Until I started really trying to invest myself in there, trying to figure out is if that's what that means, and this over here that seems contradictory to that, what does that mean? And I began to wrestle with difficult things like that. And before I knew it, it wasn't the how-to things that attracted me. It was God himself. I began to know on a much deeper level. A level in which that, you know, I, I'm by far no expert at it, but something that I see in it and I think, you know what? I think somebody else needs to hear that too. And so God plants a church. And he plants a musician in the church to start teaching him how to preach so he can teach you this great scripture. He brings people in our path like a wise old saint, Broken down old Cardinal's pitcher from way back when. He thinks he can play a little ping pong. Until he met somebody else. Right? Yeah. We have friends.
friendships. We have relationships that we build in this. And, I, and I'll tell you, this, as simple as it can be, to pick up one of those cards in that back wall over there, to put a few dollars in this bucket down here, and, and I don't, uh, I want to tell you that there's a blue bucket down here that's a special. The other buckets are for your regular tithe and your offering and your gift to the Lord. This is for the kids. I'm leaving this down here. Just if you feel compelled to get something in there, we're not paying Tom anything. He's a good friend. As a matter of fact, he's losing money by coming here because every time he comes here, he has to take me and Billy to lunch. That's just the, that's the way our relationship works, all right? But in doing so, we introduced him to Panda Express, and now he can't get enough of it, right? Introduces it to his wife, and your marriage is, do what? Oh, harass him. Harass him. <laughs> he's not making a dime off of this. I appreciate what they say, and I know that the Gideons, we went to a Gideon, our pastor's appreciation banquet a few weeks ago, hosted by the Gideons. And now they pour out their, their love, their affection, their attention to the local pastor. Uh, some of the testimonies we heard, some of the people we get to meet is very special. And so I, I just want you, I want to encourage you to be involved. Men, I want to encourage you to be involved. You can do this. I'd love to have 5, 10, 12, 15, 20 Gideons in our church. Men that are passionate about taking the word of God in our schools in the workplace, placing them in hotels, and placing them where the Word of God is not regularly heard. I'd love for our men to get behind that. I'd love for you to be a part of those things. As we have the Word of God in front of us today, we have an opportunity to dig into the Scriptures, to learn a little bit about what the Scriptures say. And we've been learning from Peter throughout the year of 2016. It seems like we've been here all year long. We pretty much have been. Second Peter's where we began a few weeks ago. And it seems like that Peter is making every effort that he can to write to Christians and to write to the beloved saints of God. And saying, you've got to know this. You need to listen. You need to know this. And so as I begin to examine, as I begin trying to share with you, what is it that he wants us to know? He keeps talking about knowledge and knowledge and knowledge. What do we need to know? We need to know the scriptures. We need to know from where we come from. We need to know from whence we've been saved. We need to know these things. Why? Because we live in a world that is trying to describe it and tear it apart. We read last week, three times, verses 12, 13, 14, Peter says, I need to remind you. I hope that you remember. I say these things so that when I'm gone, you'll be able to call these things to mind. And throughout the whole first chapter of 2 Peter here, we've been able to see and get a glimpse of Peter's heart for the saints, his passion for the saints of God, to not only be casual Christians, not only say the name Jesus, but to claim the name Jesus and to live the name Jesus and to be a bold, courageous witness for Jesus. So he reminds them to, in an effort to increase their confidence, fortify their, their faith and their trust in God. And we get to read these things. Why? Because there's a lot at stake. In verse 11, he says, The way to the entrance into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has been abundantly supplied to you. What's at stake in this? Just heaven. That's it. For you. For the ones that need to hear the voice of the Lord through you. I want to begin today as, as just restating some context here. There have been amongst the church at that time false teachers and critics that are trying to dispel the gospel and undermine the authority and the message of the apostles and and the early Christians. In Peter's efforts to discredit them or to give a response to that, come to his testimony next. And so I'm going to ask you to stand and let's listen to Peter's testimony, beginning in verse 16. Second Peter's letter, the first chapter in verse 16. In response to the critics, in response to the ones that are trying to discredit him and discredit the things that, that he knows to be true, Peter says this in verse 16, that we, the apostles, did not follow cleverly devised tales. Your scripture may say myths or fables when, when we make known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received, when he, meaning Jesus, when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven. We were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to you which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you. You may have a seat. Peter's response to these critics was first his eyewitness report. It's his personal testimony. Many times you're not going to have the gospel with you. You're not going to have a testament with you. You're not going to have the word of God or a copy of scripture with you. But what you do have is I've seen him. I've heard him. I am with him. He is in me. You have a testimony. You have an experience. You have something that you can share that says this is what I used to be and now this is who I am because of the difference that Christ has made in my life. You have a testimony. Peter is saying very much the same thing. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him. We heard the voice of heaven and we were with him on the holy mountain. He doesn't leave it there. Verse 19 says, we have this prophetic word made more sure. Peter is saying, he's not trying to put the, the, your experience and the scriptures in competition with each other. He's saying that they need to confirm one another. The experience that you've had, the, the level of, of wonderment and joy and amazement that you've had, maybe when you had first encountered Christ, go to the scriptures and let the scripture confirm what has just happened in you. So many times we go from experience to experience to experience. And we never consult the Word of God to see what it is truly we've experienced. And we find ourselves going from this to that, from this high point to this high point, and <clears throat> there's no structure, there's no truth, there's no evidence in, in between that defines for us what's truly happening to us. We, come, we become experiential. But the scripture is the more prophetic word made more sure. And, and what I want to do today is, is get into this a, a little bit deeper for you. And, and I've asked myself some questions this week. Does God really value his word? And if he does, what does he say? What is the Bible really trying to tell us? And, and I, I've got some bullet points, and some scripture bullet points in your notes today, so make sure you have those handy if you've got your uh, pen with you or something like that. Fill in these blanks as we go through, because in an effort to answer this question, is God real? Does he value his word? And what is it trying to say to me? Listen to this. Psalm 19, the confirmation is the law of the Lord is perfect. Write that in your fill in the blank today. The law of the Lord is perfect. It says it is restoring the soul. This is what we do in biblical counseling. This is what we do when you come in and you ask our counselor or our advice or something. We say, okay, let me uh, just shut up here for a little bit. Let's open the Word of God. What does the Bible have to say? It says that it's perfect and it's capable of restoring your soul. In Isaiah chapter 40, it says, the grass may wither, the flowers will fade, but the Word of the Lord will stand forever. In Isaiah 55, and this scripture was just read a few moments ago, it says the word of God will not return empty. It will not come back void. Where you sow the word of God, God is planting seeds. He's using you. He's using his word. He's using the saints to tell the world who he is. And it will not return void. It will accomplish its purpose. Ephesians, I mean, in Hebrews 4, it says the word is living and active, sharper than any two inches sword. It's not just an antiquated book, not just another outdated volume in your library. It's living, it's active, and it's capable, it is trustworthy. In Hebrews 1, the Bible says that in the former days he used to speak through his prophets and through the early fathers of Israel. He says in these last days he has spoken to us in his son, God speaking. At the very beginning, God speaks. The Bible says, and God said. 
and there was. Paul writes in his letter to, to Timothy, his second letter to Timothy, he says, from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. That was me. I've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. That means it's useful. It's beneficial for what? Teaching. What is teaching do? It tells us what is right. For reproof. What is reproof do? It teaches us what is not right. For correction. It is profitable and useful to tell us how to get right. For training how to stay right and righteous. So that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. <laughs> what is this grand book all about? What is the, the picture of this? <clears throat> I get so burdened and I talk to people all the time. And, and people come in and we counsel and we talk with them. And, and they're constantly trying to think, man, I read the Bible. And, and I pray every day. And I'm like, okay, tell me a little bit about what are you reading? And what well, I tried to read the Bible through this year. And I said, great, how far into the, the end of Exodus or the first of Leviticus did you make it? How did you know? I'm like, because it's hard. That's a hard book. There's a lot of challenging things. That, have you tried anything else or did you just give up? There's some new folks to our church, some, some that I've been, been counseling, and I think they're getting ready to join us. And, and uh, we've been talking uh, about some things and counseling with some things. And, and we didn't know it until probably the second or third session. And finally, they began to tell me the things that you're telling us we've never heard before. And I said, you grew up in a church and you've never heard this before. What about this? No. What about this? No. I said, then we got to get you back into the scripture. We, you've got to learn how to read the Bible. They said, we've never been challenged to read the Bible. We've been in church all our lives. Heard a lot of stories, but we've never been challenged to read. I don't even know where to start. Where do we start? I said, I got this Bible. Let's start with Jesus. And so I told them to pick up, and I wrote down on their notes, this may be for you, maybe something that you want to try. Read through Luke and Acts. Gospel of Luke, the book of Acts. Gospel of Luke is the third gospel. The same author writes both books. The Gospel of Luke is all about the life of Jesus. And then the book of Acts picks up when Jesus leaves the earth and the church is born. Great place to start. Write that down. That'd be a challenge for you and maybe somebody else in your family. You can read Luke and Acts in a month. Just about three chapters a day. But I said, we got to get you reading it again because it's not a matter of what kind of advice that I give you and what I say, but what does the Bible say? What is the text trying to say? And our effort of teaching through Peter this year has been in what is called an expositional style. It is what does the text say? Say, what is thus saith the Lord? I'm not going to stand up here and give you a bunch of funny stories and give you my life history so you can learn from me. I want you to hear what the text says. And so at the beginning of this today, I want to show you this. In verses 19, 20, and 21, let's find out what the text really says. All right? I've given you some space to take some notes in your bulletin there. And uh, so please get that handy. I've given you in very small terms, <laughs> very small text up here, some of my notes so you can look at. And I'm going to clarify some of that for you. But in your notes today, in an effort to give you some exposition of what the, the Bible is saying, let's begin here in verse 19. So we circle that word in your bulletin in your notes today. And let's understand up until this point, every time we is mentioned, Peter's referring to himself as the apostles. But now we refers to all believers. So he says, we all believers have the prophetic word. Now to Peter and the, and the early disciples, that was the Old Testament. That's all they had. Then they began to distribute letters, the letters of Paul, the letters of John, the letters of Peter. They began to establish those. By now we know that we as all believers have all the scriptures, all 66 books in the canon, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have the Bible. So we believers have the Bible made more sure. That means in addition and comfort and confirming our experience, the life-changing experience that we've had with Christ, more sure. That means more certain. The ESV says more fully confirmed. And 
I like that translation. So we believers have the Bible made more fully confirmed to which you would do well to pay attention. Circle that in your notes today. You would do well to pay attention to what this book has to say. And above that, I'm giving you the words up here. Listen, look, and follow. How do we pay attention? You have to listen to what's being said. You have to look deeper into what it's trying to tell you. And then you have to do it. What did the Bible say in James? To be not just hearers of the word, but what else? Doers of the word. We have to apply this. When we think of faith, we don't think of faith so much as a noun. We have to think of it as a verb. It is what we do with Christ. We trust him and we act upon that. Faith is a verb. Trust is a verb. Pay attention is a verb. Listen, look, and follow as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Above the word lamp, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does is to bring light to darkness. Around that dark place, what this means in, in the Greek text here is a murky swamp. A muddy, murky swamp. That's what the world is that we live in today. A murky swamp. If you don't believe that, turn on the news. If you don't believe that, turn on the entertainment station. If you don't believe that, watch some of the athletes. If you don't believe that, watch some of the people around you and how they respond to difficult times. It is the evil blackness of the fallen world. It's what sin has done to ravage the perfection of the Garden of Eden. The Holy Spirit, though, shines a light in this dark, murky swamp until the day dawns that means the day that Christ returns and the morning star arises in your heart. Circle that phrase there, morning star. And I don't know if you can read it or not, but I've got three phrases up here of what morning star means. To so the astronomer, this is Venus. Right before the dawn breaks, right before the sun comes up in the morning, the brightest star in the sky is not a star. It's a planet. It's the planet Venus. And so when the astronomers look at this, and we can know right before you look, now, I don't get to see this very much, because I prefer not to be up before dawn. Thank you very much. But, uh, but you can tell which one it is. You can navigate by it. You can know when the light is about to dawn amongst the darkness because the morning stars in the sky. That's to the astronomer, to the chemist. What happens when you mix this chemical with this chemical together? It makes a reaction to something that glows in the dark. The Greek word for this is phosphorus. What does that term mean in English? You heard that before? Phosphorus, right? Something that is phosphorus glows in the dark. To the astronomer, the star in the sky. To the chemist, it's a chemical reaction, not something else. To the believer, to the Christian. Is the light of Christ shining in a dark place, in a dark and murky swamp? He said, you would do well to pay attention to this. But he says in verse 20, know this first of all. He said, this is an important note. This needs to be stated before anything else. Know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. And it's very important for you, to, above the word matter, where is it? Way over there in the top right, to write in the word originates. Because the scripture is for us to learn. The scripture is for us to interpret as to what God's voice is telling us. But that's not what this text is saying. This text is saying no prophecy of scripture originates from one's own interpretation of what God is saying. You see the difference in that? We have an opportunity to open God's word and interpret for ourselves what God is telling us. But at the same time, that is not an act. We'll look at the next verse. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. It never came from humanity. It is God's voice. It is what God has said. It is what God has given to this human instrument to be able to write things down and say, this is what God is trying to tell his people. No prophecy of scripture is a matter or originates from one's own interpretation. It's not a result of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit. I have two terms written above this, right here. It's being right above, moved by the Spirit, right in your, your notes. Carried along and ferried along. There's a difference there. And two different commentators had this, this word picture where they're putting it. Man, it really just drove something home with me this week. Carried along means that you are a ship with a sail. And what happens to a ship when the wind's not blowing? It doesn't move, does it? But when the wind begins to blow, it fills the sail and the ship moves. 
That's one word picture. The second word picture, when we, that, that's how we, we we're talking about interpreting scripture, where scripture comes from. And then there's this ferry along. How many of you have ever been on a ferry before? We had to drive your car up on a boat to get from one place to another. Raise your hand. Y'all been there before? Yeah, good. Good group here, good group in the first service. I've never been on one of these before. But when it comes to the inspiration of Scripture and men moved by the Holy Spirit, what, what this, this word picture is this, that multiple vehicles from multiple places multiple, and multiple times come and they get on this boat and they go, but they are all arrive at the same destination. All right? Over the course of thousands of years, 40 plus writers and authors are responsible for the text that we have today. Over several thousands of years, more than 40 writers were included in this. The cool thing about this is that they were all coming from different places, from different areas, from different inspirations and everything, but they all came to the same conclusion. This is the voice of the Lord. Now, for me, who likes word pictures, who likes to see things like that, that's extremely important for me because in an effort to try to explain Scripture to people, the first, one of the first things they try to do is they try to discredit things. They try to say, look, here's the deal. God is capable of doing that, but there's all kinds of other humans involved in this, so people are going to screw up. They're going to err somewhere. They're, they're going to commit an error. They're going to sin against something because they're just human. Like, well, that's true. <clears throat> You're right. The problem is, is it's this last phrase. It's from God. Not an act of human will. It's from God. And so we got to consider the source, don't we? We must consider the source. Where does this Bible come from? Where does this text come from? What is Peter trying to say in this text? He's trying to say, look, I know that there's people out there that are trying to discredit what you're learning. I know that there's people out there trying to stretch the truth as far as they can to justify their own sinful behaviors. I know that false teachers are being able to creep their way and subtly pull you away from the truth. But listen to me. I was there. I heard him. Not only was I there, the story is corroborated through the scriptures. The Old Testament testifies about him. The letters of Paul testify about him. My letter to you is a testimony from me to you that says I was with him and I saw him and I heard the voice of the Lord. My letter to you says hang in there. It's the, the falseness is coming. The division is coming. But you must know this. And I would say the same thing to you today. If you just sit in here and you listen to me and you say, well, okay, that was a good message and you leave. But you never get in it any deeper. You never seek him any further in his word. How are you going to know the difference? Don't. More often times that you, you don't. You can go to the grocery store, pick up a box of Lucky Charms, and enjoy a bowl of cereal. And next week, Lucky Charms, new and improved, is going to be out there. And you're going to pull that, pour that in there, same bowl, same milk, same cereal, and is it really going to be new and improve your life? No. They may have one more shape of marshmallow over there so they can say that it's new and improved. But it's not. It's just a lie. It's just a ploy. It's just an effort for some to say, you don't have to follow that. You don't have to do that. There are words that are thrown around in theological circles today. You've heard some of them, and I want to touch just, just a few of them real quick. They're important words to us, and they're words that we need to know. We need to have a little description of them, but it is. Uh, so what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to open this can of words, and then I'm just going to sit it out there, and we're going to probably have to deal with it another time, and, and maybe at a deeper level somehow, but it's important for you to know at least the nuts and bolts of this when it comes to this scripture. That it's not an act of human will. It's not a matter of one's own interpretation. It doesn't originate with men. It comes from God. And we know this because the Bible says that God breathed it out. The Bible says that it is inspired. All scripture is inspired. In your notes today, as for inspiration, write this down. It is God breathed. You can write in there, it is divinely influenced. God's breath and divine influence. The scriptures all point to him. So R.C. Sproul says, in the mystery of inspiration, the Holy, the Holy Spirit so protected the text 
that he used the very style, the very vocabulary style, the very humanity that each author brought to the text, but he preserved each author from teaching error. In your space under inspiration, under inspiration it's important that you write this down. God protects the text and he preserves the author. God is the perfect source and he breathes his word into existence. Yes, it's antiquated. Yes, it's old. Yes, it was a long, long time ago when this was first given. Yes, many human authors and hands have touched it since then. But if God is the source and he is perfection, is he capable of protecting his word? Amen. Yes or no? Yes. Is he capable of preserving each author so that he will speak to them and breathe to them so that they will not write down the wrong thing? Is he capable of that? Yes, yes he is. To give you just two bullet points as to what inspiration is not, you don't necessarily have to write these down, but it's not audible dictation. We have this idea that Isaiah is sitting on a hill somewhere and he becomes God's secretary. It's not the way it happens. God moves and breathes through the individual. I don't know exactly how it happened. I wasn't there. You may have to ask Tom about it afterwards. He might be able to tell you about that. But uh, just love you, Tom. Uh, you can meet Carl afterwards. He was there. So, uh, <laughs> But as for inspiration, this God breathing through a human instrument, Isaiah was not God's secretary. He was his instrument to get his word out to his people. It's also every word of the Bible is true and it's given and it's inspired. It's not just get God giving these broad, general outlines, these broad, general concepts, and then allowing the human author to fill in the blanks. That's not inspiration. That's what Hollywood does. They take the scriptures and then they just fill in the blanks with things that aren't entertaining enough for them or don't give them enough information. That's not inspiration. Inspiration is God breathing, divine influence in his people. There's another word that we throw around, it's called inerrancy. As for inerrancy, this is what this means it, it means free from fraud, falsehood, and deceit. Free from fraud, falsehood, and deceit. And please write this in your notes today. It is a claim only the original manuscripts can make. Only the original manuscripts can make this. We do not have many of the original manuscripts. We have copies of copies. But I say that so you remember the point that I just made. Is God perfect? Yes. Is God sovereign? Yes. Is God capable of preserving the text? Yes. Is God capable of speaking through his authorship and preserving each author so that it will not ever err? Yes. Because God is free from God. God is free from falsehood and deceit. He will see to it that his servants are as well. One author says, though the biblical writings were inspired, this does not imply that the writers knew everything that they were writing about. And you can check out 1 Peter in chapter 1. Said, they, they were making careful searches and inquiries. I can see Isaiah trying to write something down and went, what? You're going to send your servant and he's going to be bruised and wounded and crushed. And that's going to be in your will. You're going to send your son. For behold, a virgin shall conceive, he says. For unto us a child is born, he writes. He's thinking, okay, I get it. A child is being born. He doesn't know when. He doesn't know where. He knows that his name will be called Emmanuel. It means God with us. He's got this idea, and he continues to write. And in chapter 53, even though he didn't write the chapter, but eventually he gets down to the end of his writing, and he says, this same son is going to be crushed for the iniquity of us all. What could he have been thinking? Really? That's your plan? He didn't even know everything. Further insight and, and, and understanding for us to realize this is not an act of human will. Isaiah came from a priestly family. Some came from, some were shepherds. Some, Hosea being one of them, God required to go and marry a prostitute so that he could prophesy to his people.
This is what you're doing to me when you follow other gods. You prostitute yourself. But just like you're going to give your heart to her in marriage, so I give my heart to my people if you will come to me and respond to me. Can you imagine what these prophets are trying to write down, trying to figure all this out? Not even they knew, but they wrote down what God was breathing into them. And it was perfect, and it was inherent. But saying that, the copies that we have today are copies of copies. And variations between copies and originals do exist. I checked out one of my favorite websites, godquestions.org, on this word. And the author of this article says there is no biblical promise that copies of the original manuscripts would equally be inerrant or free from copyist errors. Can humans err in some things? Absolutely. As the Bible has been copied thousands of times over thousands of years, some copyist errors have likely occurred. So this is when the critics stand up and go, see, I told you. But if you'll take a look at, our, at the copies that we do have from the third century, then you take the copies that we have from the 15th century, and then you take the copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls that we received hundreds of years after that, and you examine them, they almost identically match. Can God preserve his word over 1,200 years? Sure. So if he can do it over 1,200 years, can he do it over 4,000 years? Sure. He's sovereign. He's God. He is the source. Most of the differences that we see in our copies of Scripture today as compared to the, the 15th century, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the 3rd century context are all simple punctuation marks. Word endings, uh, grammatical differences in the way that they say some things, uh, a word order in, in the words that will get out of, of order sometime in the way that they copy things down. But God's word has been preserved. God's word has been kept. God's perfect word has been kept inerrant. Yeah. Because God is inerrant. You can trust with absolute confidence today through all the science and all the textual criticism that's been out there and, and all the study that's been put into these things. You can trust that the copy of scripture that you hold in your hands today is God's authoritative, inspired, inerrant word. Praise be to God. We have this picture of himself. And many will come and they will say, well, what about that word infallible? There's another word, I don't have it in your notes today, you can put that in there, but it's not a question of rightness or wrongness, it's merely a question of potential. A potential. Is God capable of making an error? No. Is God capable of making a mistake? No. Is God capable of, of producing a perfect word through fallen people? Absolutely. He does it all the time. Look around the room. You see imperfections all around the room that God's doing amazing things through. Trophies of grace, co-heirs with Jesus. Remember the old Gaither song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Joint heirs as we travel this saw and this earth, look at what he does for us. But there, like I said, there's plenty of people that want to attack it. There's plenty of people that want to come alongside and, and pick out all these things, and they're easy faults, and there's, there's seemingly contradictory statements in there. There's certainly a lot of politically incorrect attitudes and behaviors and statements made in the scriptures that people want to look at and say, look, I'm not going to be a part of that. There's slavery in the Bible. There's polygamy in the Bible. And there's all these other rules and regulations that, that just, that's just so antiquated and so out of date. And let me tell you that you can listen to them all you want to. And it's not truth. We're going to discover next week as we get into chapter 2 what the false teachers are saying. Cause them destructive heresies. Subtle little digs into the scripture. But these Bible attackers, these Bible critics, they don't have a leg to stand on. Why? For one, they don't know God. Alright? They can pick out punctuation marks, they can pick out word order, they can pick out some grammatical issues, some politically incorrect statements, but there's a fundamental problem at the very beginning for them. And it's this. They're lost. Amen. They're spiritually blind. They are without the Holy Spirit. Who knows the mind of God but the Holy Spirit? Who can therefore inspire the Word of God and write down the mind of God but the Holy Spirit? So if the Spirit of God's not in you, who are you to criticize anything? You don't know what you're talking about. Why do they 
they attack it? Why do they attack it? Why did they pull it apart? Right here, read it with me, Ephesians 4.12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is why they attack it. Because the Bible pierces their soul down into the very marrow of their being. They judge it. They criticize it. They undermine it. They try to divide it. They take it apart. They try to pull the pieces out that they don't like and put the pieces in that they do like, writing in the text for themselves. But they don't know what they're talking about. They're being judged by the Word of God because it is a piercing, living, active sword. They don't like it because it judges their thoughts, the inclinations, the intentions of their heart. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want anybody bossing me around. I've said this before. We're all about wanting a Savior, but very few of us were Lord. I'm all about wanting somebody to save me when I'm in peril, when I'm in danger. But I don't want them coming over to my house and teaching me or telling me how to parent my kids, how to love my wife, or which direction to mow my yard. <laughs> I don't need that. I don't want a boss. And neither does most other people, especially those who are without Christ. Everybody wants to go to heaven. They want to go on their turn. Everybody wants to be free from the bondage of this body and the sinfulness and the ravages of this world. And they want eternal bliss, but they want to do it on their own terms. And they go from experience to experience to experience, trying to find the right one that lasts. And none of them do. Peter says, I experienced him. And I have a prophetic word made more sure, more confirmed. So I know. issue lies with the source. Do you know the source? Who is the source of Scripture? Who is the one that breathes them into existence? Is he capable of error? Is there anything that troubles him? Can he who is profession not sustain his chosen instruments and his holy writings? He's perfect. He is the source which makes this word authoritative. So his scriptures are inspired, they are inerrant, they are infallible, and they are authoritative. It means there's no peer, no companion, no other rival. The Bible is the undeniable authoritative word of God to humanity. It is the sole objective source of all that God has given, and it is reliable, and it is sufficient for everything pertaining to life and godliness. You can consult it, you can trust it, you can be counseled in it, you can live according to it, and you will find him when you seek him in here. As for the interpretation, the origin of it, how we learn from it, we take what it's not. It's not an act of human will, and it's not man's opinion. So if you find yourself in a church, you find yourself in a place where somebody is just giving you their opinion on what they think the Bible says, get up and leave. What human beings might think or want has nothing to do with divine prophecy. You want to be fed, I hope, and be inspired, I hope, by what thus saith the Lord. It is not my desire nor my duty to make you Christ's disciples. It is to introduce you to the one that can make you a Christ disciple. And also, so many interpret this to say this is only for the preacher. Only for the preacher boys. It's for the clergy only. This is why a lot of our denominations are in serious, serious trouble. They never challenge their people to be. 
They never challenge for people to teach. As a matter of fact, they don't even mention much about Bible study or Bible reading. You come to a church, the priest anoints it, he speaks it, and there you go. But if the priest is in error, or the pastor is in error, there is never any accountability to the truth that's being shared. Oh, that you would know. Oh, that you would know. I say this in the bottom of your notes. Simply take God and His Word, and the fog will lift, and the light of His Word will illumine your path, and the day will dawn with the warmth of God's morning star taking up residence in your heart. And since the Spirit gave the Word, and only the Spirit could teach the Word and interpret it correctly, this is who we must listen to. Amen? Amen. Bow your hands with me. I don't know everything about this book. I'm still learning. But I trust it. Because I trust Him. And I implore you for every fiber of my being and yours to resist the false and embrace the perfect truth. You gotta read it. You have to accept it. You would do well to pay attention to it. The law of the Lord is perfect. Restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. Precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Listen to it. Look deeper into it. But please follow it. God loves you and has paid a great price for you. He tells you in his book, from his heart. Through the hands of his chosen instruments, I love you and I want a relationship with you. Please follow me. How would you ever know him about the scriptures? How would you ever know of this awesome love? Unless he had told you. Thank you, Lord, for your scriptures. May your spirit continue to teach us and instruct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.